Okay, hopefully we're live here. Uh, Keith and Theodore on the far end, if you can hear me, if you could raise your hand in chat or, or just type something in chat to let me know that you're, you're hearing me successfully. Okay, looks looks good. Okay, well, thanks everyone. Oh, and we have okay, we have Jackie Ritzko that just joined in as well. So, um, Jackie, I don't know if you're to the point where you have your audio up and running, but if you do, if you'd raise your hand or just type something in the chat to let me know that uh, that you're on and you're hearing for us. Okay. So thanks. Wow, this is great. Thanks everyone for coming in, and I really appreciate the folks that are coming in from outside the university. Uh, I know some of you tried to register for it with a friend of Penn State account, and that, uh, that system is not set up to do that, so I learned something new about that. But anyway, I'm happy to have you here. Um, for those of you that are actually in the room, if you haven't signed the attendance sheet there, I'd really appreciate it if you do it, uh, just so we can kind of keep track of numbers and so on. So I promise I won't spam you. Uh, on you know, without uh, without due cause. So, anyway, um, I'll talk a little bit about um, the Kingdom of Loathing, and I actually got into Kingdom of Loathing about two years and two days ago because I just got my second year anniversary present from the from the game, which is kind of interesting. And showed up was a pair of um, some sort of special pants that give you special powers. So, not much. But anyway. Kingdom of Loathing, I'll talk about that a little bit, and I also wanted to talk about uh, Richard Bartle's game player types and why I think Kingdom of Loathing really is an exemplar, perhaps not of a game that you personally would like to play, but of a game that embodies its player types and therefore appeals to a large audience. So, Kingdom of Loathing is just a very silly game, and that's why uh, I put the little stick figure up there, they, they use really primitive graphics, and there's all sorts of parodies in the game in the text. So one of them is it says an adventure is you when you log in, and that's from an old Japanese game that was translated to English, and the translation was really, really lousy. <laughs> so anyway, um, what is it? It's a very simple turn-based game. So you, you sign into Kingdom of Loathing, and you're given 40 adventures a day. And, and as you can kind of see from the from the graphic here. It's very simple hand drawing, images, uh, stick figures, and so on. And a lot of people will get to Kingdom of Loathing and they look at that and they immediately turn away from it because it, it's obviously not Mass, mass Effect 2. It's, it's not a uh, you know, virtual world or anything like that. It's very simple and primitive. That's not where the strength lies. Yeah, Theodore, I, I, uh, the, the, the shuffling should have stopped at this point. It was people getting their uh, stuff out of their brown bags. So you get 40 adventures per day, and you can actually increase that by eating and drinking food. Uh, and some food will give you one or two extra adventures, and some will give you up to like 30 adventures, depending on the number of adventures. Um, and adventure is basically a turn. Uh, so um, you go, you go. I'll show you when we get into KOL itself, and I'll show you what, what that actually looks like. Um, so you have different characters, which and these characters are silly. If you take a look at them, you have a turtle tamer you can be, a seal clubber, and they're the muscle people. They're the ones that bash on things. Then you have the sorcerers and the postamancers, who are the magic users, so to speak. And then you have accordion thieves and disco bandits, which are more of the rogue type character that run around and steal things. Um, meat is the coin of the realm, believe it or not. So if you, you pound on something and, and you defeat it, you get Instead of money, you get meat, which is you can use to trade for other things. Uh, there is chat built into this game. Very simple text chat, uh, very much like what you're seeing in the, this Adobe Connect session, where you'll see the people's name, and you know, they'll take back and forth and so on. They do some pretty interesting things with chat here that I want to talk about. Um, you can join a clan, and in fact, you, you know it's hardly recommended you, you join a clan. And basically, when you join a clan, you're, you're given a lounge you can go to where you can heal. Uh, there's new adventures that are offered through, through the clan area. And it also uh, gives you a sense of community because some of, the, some of the adventures you play, you have to do through chat with your clan members. And so the whole idea of the game, to sum it up, is to play the game over and over. That's what it's all about. So what you do is you play the game, 
I mean, if he's the bad guy, uh, or in this case, the Melanie Saucer is the bad woman, and then you're given the choice to ascend, which means you start over again as a different character, but you get to keep your stuff. So over time, you accumulate vast amounts of stuff. So let's take a look. And what I'm going to do here is I'm going to stop this and hopefully get into Kingdom of Logan itself. Folks on the far end, uh, it, again, I just want to make sure you're seeing the screen. So if you could just raise your hand or type something in the chat briefly that lets me know that you are indeed seeing the screen. Because one of the things I don't like about Adobe Connect is when you go full screen, you lose the, the Adobe Connect window. Okay, thank, thank you, Keith. Okay, so here we are on Kingdom of Loathing. Let's take just, just take a look at the, the, the screen layout for a second. If you look over on the left, you'll see there I am, Breath of Bold, right down on a level 30 pasta manager, which is actually quite high. Usually people get to around level 15 and they ascend. I stuck around this time because I wanted to go into some of the higher level dungeons, and, and the only way to get there is to build your levels up. But you can see I'm a pasta mancer, and there I have my uh, pasta spoon and so on. <laughs> I have three different stats basically that you work with, which muscle, which is how hard you can hit, how many hit points you have, mysticality, which has to do with spell casting, and your moxie, which which has to do with leveling leveling up and how effective you are at stealing things and so on. Moxie is kind of a weird category. So then I have my hit points, and of course I'm at 390 out of 825, so I'm about half. There's my magic points, or, or they could be muscle points, mysticality points, or moxie points, depending on what class you play. Um, you can see there's my meat. I have um, 3,500,000 chain bed. And I have 200 adventures. You can bank up to 200 adventures. After that, you, leave, you don't gain any more. So what a lot of people do is they'll get up to 200, then they'll play them down um, to maybe 50, and then wait a day or so, come back in until they you get 40 a day, plus extra stuff you wear will give you extra adventures sometimes. So the rest of this stuff, I'm not going to talk about everything here, but I do have a familiar whose name right now is Gribble, and she's a flaming gravy fairy, which means she can attack with fire and so on. And then I have a couple of effects that have been added to me. The Sonata of Sneakiness decreases the likelihood I will encounter other monsters, and it increases the likelihood that I'll have non-combat adventures, and sometimes that's useful. I won't go into all that kind of stuff, because you really don't even know that. This is your main area here in the middle, where you, you know, point and click and go to different places. And then over here is where you have your chat area, over on, on the right side. So, and you have announcements. So I'm going to enter the chat, just to give you an idea. And I'm currently in, in there's different channels in this you can switch from. I'm currently in the Hoboopolis channel because that's one of the highest <coughs> ones I've been playing. And that lets me talk to other people that are in there and see what they're doing and so on. And in fact, the rules of my clan state you should not go into Hoboopolis without being in chat so people know you're there. So, so let's just poke around a little bit. Let's go to Seaside Town, which is really pretty much where you start. Um, and you, you'll see here. What you usually do is, is you go to the Council of Loathing that give you the, the, the main quest adventures, but there's all sorts of side quests too. And they're not going to tell me much of anything because I've actually finished up this time and I really should be ascending, but I haven't, so it's telling me. And I'm just going to leave this up here for a second so you can look at the text because the text in this game is just hilarious. Um, a lot of times 
The text will refer to obscure movie references or pop culture references, and you'll get them about half the time, and sometimes you don't, but if you go to the, the, the KOL wiki, um, there's usually a section at the end of each page that describes where the <coughs> reference came from. <coughs> They're just from all over the board, so it's just absolutely hilarious. So, and if you look over in the, the chat area, you'll see it's being refreshed, and there's some people over there that are down in the heap, which is an area of Hobolopolis. It's a garden heap, and they're doing some silly stuff down there. So, basically, the council is telling me I'm done, and they're telling me to get the heck out of here. But I, like I said, I decided to stick on it. So, in here, I can go to a lot of places. I can the clan district will take me to my clan. I can go to the right side of the tracks or the wrong side of the tracks. That's where all the shady stuff happens. I can go to the market. So I'm going to go to the market square there. And you can see here, I can go and buy trophies for different accomplishments I've made. I can go to the market and buy things that I need. I can go get some armory if I want to. Here's a flea market where people sell things that they've, they've got and so on. Or I can go into the sewer and try to pull stuff up out of that. So let's take, take a leave of Seaside Town and just take a look and usually what happens when you start out, the only thing you see at first is Seaside Town. And then as the Council of Loathing gives you different adventures or you talk to different people, different stuff starts to show up on your map until it's fully populated. Um, so here's your campground where you can go, you can rest, you can put different, <coughs> different things in there and so on. The big mountains, let's go there. You can see here, I have Mount McLarge Huge. I have the Valley Beyond the Orc Chasm. Um, all sorts of silly places I can go. The Hall of the Legends of the Times of Old. You kind of get the idea. It's very, very silly. Uh, Mount Noob is actually where you start when you've never been there before. Um, you know, Noob is a common term. But anyway, if I go to Mount McLarge Huge, there's adventures I can do here. I can go to the Lair of the Ninja Snowman. And well, let's just go there and I'll play an adventure. So take a look. Ninjas are as cold as ice and willing to sacrifice Willing to willing off sacrifice your love. I don't know if you've ever heard the, the you know, you're as cold as ice, mm -hmm. willing to sacrifice your love. So there's all that kind of stuff in there. So I'm going to attack him. And oops, I fumbled, so I lost a lot of hit points. And I'm gonna attack him again. And I've just used one adventure or one one turn for the day. So you see I went down from from two hundred to one ninety nine. So that's basically how an adventure runs. And sometimes you get things from people, they'll drop things, sometimes they don't. So let's go to the AC Peak. And I'm fighting a not yeti. And I'll hit them. And there I got uh, some yeti fur. So one of the things I can do with the yeti fur is I can go down to the trapper's cabin and I can offer to trade the Yeti furs that, they, that I have for different things. And then depending on the character class I'm in, I can make things. Like if, if I am a um, uh, turtle tamer, I can take the hippopotamus skin and make a helmet out of the hippopotamus skin and so on. So just to show you a few more things, I think you kind of get the idea here. I can go to these different places. I can go to the district woods. I can interact there. I can go to Whitey's Grove or the White Sittle or the Spooky Forest or the Hidden Temple or so on. Um, I can go to the Mysterious Island of Mystery. I can go to the Desert Beach there. And the Lair of the Naughty Saucers is what shows up. She's, she's the main bad character that you eventually end up defeating. You go there and fight through a series of adventures. That eventually shows up, but not until you're about level 13 or so. So, there's that part of it. You can see up here, there's all sorts of different things you can do. You can take a look at your look, latest quests that you have. Um, you can take a look at the quests you've completed. And you can see they're all, they all have silly names and everything. So there's all sorts of quests that you can take. Other things I've accomplished this particular time around. Um, I've earned 14 trophies, I've collected familiars, I found the Dolphin King's treasure, et cetera, et cetera. So that's one part of it, but but that, if you just played the game and just did that, you're only scratching the surface of it. There's lots of other things you can do. For instance, you craft things, you can combine things, and some of the things you have to do 
for quests involve combining silly items like the broken skull or a box with um, a drab sonata maybe. And if it works, it works, and if it doesn't, then it, you just can't combine them. You can make cocktails, which are drinks that, that give you extra adventures. You can actually cook food by combining items down there, and you can learn different recipes and so on. And you can do all sorts of things. So just to show you, after you've played for a couple of years, here's the different recipes that I've learned as far as different potions and casseroles and kebabs and soup and all sorts of things. And these all, these are worthwhile because, for instance, the Cool Mushroom Cast Room will give you like 10 extra adventures if you need it. So it's worth, if you want more adventures per day, that's what you do. So, uh, let's see, other things. I think that's, that, that's enough since we we're, don't have tons and tons of time. So I'm going to switch back to Adobe Connect now. Stop the <coughs> sharing. Pull up my PowerPoint again. And so we took a look at that, and yeah, not very vegetarian friendly. Actually, you can do a path as you, there's different ways you can do an ascension, and one is just a regular, but you can also go through as a teetotaler, which means you can't drink anything. You can go through as I think what they call an oxygenarian, which I think that's that means you can't eat or drink. And then there's one where you, you don't need anything. So there's different ways you can go through too. And I don't want to go, it's, it's really complex. So um, like I said, I'm only scratching the surface of what KOL is all about. So here's the essential. You adventure in quest, you build skills. And this is one of those screens that didn't translate really well to, to uh, Adobe Connect. So there's some bleed over there. Uh, you defeat the big boss and then you sense and start the process all over again. It, it sounds silly and it is silly. This is a silly, silly game. But what makes it compelling? Why are people playing in there? And I go in there and there's some people, they're in there all the time. And I think some of them are in there not just to play the game, but to talk and so on, which gets in Bartle's player types. So let's take a look. What are game player types? Well, Richard Bartle is, uh, he's a PhD, he's from England. Uh, he was the co-author of the first multi-user dungeon, uh, which are called MUDs, if you've ever heard of them. They're like text-based adventure games called named Colossal Cave. Uh, you know, it's one, of, it's one of the biggies that was out there. And there's still probably about 100 variations of Colossal Cave out there today and that people are playing. Um, he wrote an article back, I think it was 1996, called Hearts, or named Hearts, Clubs, Diamonds, and Spades, Players Who Suit MUDs. And I think he really touched on a very important thing for educators to consider when they're developing games. Re regular game developers too, but, but for educators, since we want to keep the game fun, um, I think it's very important. The URL is there. I have uploaded my PowerPoint, and at the end of that I will share it with all of you, so in case you were furiously scribbling, you'll, you'll have the PowerPoint. Anyway, if you type in Richard Bartle and just type in MUD on Google, you'll, this article will come up. It's, it's a, it's a high-level pop. Here's what Colossal Cave looks like in some variations. Like I said, it's text-based. And gotta love the old green screens. Um, so you, you got these uh, you know, text commands and basically you would type northeast, south, or west, or take rock, or, or, or you know, kill ogre, or that kind of stuff. Um, those games actually are still very popular uh, and they really are the basis for really all the games you play today. But anyway, he came up with these four game of player types that he named achievers, explorers, socializers, and killers. And each one of these looks at a game from a very different standpoint. So achievers play the game primarily because they want to build skills and achieve high levels. They like to act upon the world. So they're in there, they're banging on stuff. They want to get the highest score, they want to get the highest level, they want to they do all that kind of stuff. Explorers just like to poke around. They like to figure out all the tricks of the game and how it works, and they, so they're interacting with the world. They're the ones that will go into the 54th level of a dungeon that no one's ever been into before, not because there might be something 
you know, really powerful there or, or, or it will give them, you know, lots of gold or anything. It's just so they can say that they've been there and they've explored it and, and maybe they can tell other people. Socializers like to talk to other people. They like to talk to other people about the game. They also use the game as a venue to talk about their personal life. And, you know, sometimes you'll hear things from World of Warcraft where people have gone in there, not to play the game, but just to get together and talk and then go down to a beach and, they'll, you know, they'll sit there and talk with each other and have a picnic, which is not what World of Warcraft was designed with. Those are the socializers. They want to interact with other players. That's why they're there. They don't like the single player games. They, they like more of the, you know, the, the, the massive multiplayer online games where you are interacting with other players. Then, of course, you have the killers. These are the people that want to impose their will on other players. They want to kill other players. They want to grief other players. You've probably heard the term griefing. Uh, those, those are killer type players. They want to act upon other players. They're, they're there just basically to, uh, you know, live out their road rage or whatever. So, for those of you that like graphics, this is a, this is a graphic that kind of kind of shows where the where the, where the four different player <coughs> types fit between acting and interacting between the players in the world. So, like I said, I'm not going to leave anything up there any too long. But um, so achievers in KOL. What's 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 so great about KOL, and what have they done in KOL that makes it really good for achievers? Well, first of all, you have numerous quests, which I think is important for any type of games that we build in higher ed or elsewhere. Uh, you have the ability to ascend multiple times, which means you can play the game over and over and over. And, and of course, from a from a selling standpoint, that's what game developers want. Do we want that in, in education? Yeah, maybe, maybe not. Um, you can you can display your accomplishments for other people to see. So you have a trophy case. You earn these trophies. You earn these you know different familiars. You can display as much or as little in KOL to other players as you want. And it's very easy to look up because when you're in chat or something like that, you click on a player's name and their profile pops up for you. So for people that like to have bragging rights, that's what it's all about. Uh, there's tons of that in there. Um, you can, and another thing that's really, really kind of interesting is I talked about ascending and, and replaying the game over and over. In this particular game, uh, there are techniques for rapid ascension. So instead of taking 30 days to ascend, there's even one guy that did it in one day. He actually put it on YouTube and, and advertised it. I don't know how he did it, he's nuts. But that's uh, that's a very big point right in this particular game. So the whole idea, I think, for educators is build these sorts of things in so that the achievers feel like they're achieving constantly and they're able to share what they've done with other players. You know, a lot of times we build games and there's a leaderboard at the end, but there's nothing inside the game itself that shows what they did to get there. Something to think about. Explorers. Okay, well, well, I won't say, I'll take uh, I'll take that with a grain of salt. There is an end of interesting places to explore, but there, it's pretty big, and you can really go go as deep as you want. There's one dungeon in there that's 500 levels deep. So, um, different character classes have different exploration possibilities. So when you come in as a one character and you make some choices there in the beginning, certain areas are open to you and certain areas are not. So as you play through and you ascend, the game does change slightly. You also have special adventures that occur sometimes just out of the blue. Um, <coughs> new errors are being added to it periodically. I think that's important here, and I think in the, in the social media games that we're seeing uh, that are on Facebook and other places, that seems to be some of the things they try to do is they're trying to add new stuff to it all the time. And primarily for the explorers so that they feel satisfied. Um, in addition, there's a ton of Web2 tools out there and KOL chat that allows other people to share their knowledge. And I think that's really important. And Bartle didn't really touch upon this in his article in 1996 because that was really before there were all these chat opportunities out there and there were all these social media tools out there. Now that they're out there, explorers, I think, are, are really kind of coming into their own because not only not only do they personally know that they've, they've done all this exploration, but they're able to share it with other people and they're able to put up wikis on how to use systems and so on. And I think that's for, if we do stuff in ed education, I think we ought to think about that and give students a venue to, to share what they've done. Socializers. 
There's KOL chat. There's the Web2 tools I mentioned for the socializing as well. There's the clans you can join. Um, and believe it or not, they found a really interesting way to use chat to turn what is basically an individual game into a synchronous quest game. So some of the dungeons you go into now, when you go in there, you have to chat with other people and find out what's going on in order to hit the same area at the same time. And somehow the system knows that, and you reap better rewards when you do that. So through, through chatting and socialization, they've kind of turned an individual game into a group game. So it's a very interesting way of approach, approaching it. Oh, I love this graphic. <laughs> killers. There's limited opportunity in KOL for killers. However, you can turn your campground into a player versus player arena. You do it by breaking the, the mystical hippie stone in your camp and then it's open. Um, that only works with other killers that have opted to do player versus player. So you have so many player versus player things a, 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 um, a day or per adventures, set of adventures, and basically you bash on each other and you, know, you can pull some articles off that where they can take stuff off you. So what does that mean? Um, KOL does really provide all, for all four player types, not so much for the killer, but definitely the other three. Uh, and Bartle stresses a need, in, in his article, if you read it, he does stress a need for balance in a great game. Um, in the example I'll put up there, if you have a game with a lot of socialization built into it, but players can't act upon the world um, or can't, can't achieve great things, you're going to lose the achievers. Then the game will go out of balance, and what happens is, without those achievers in there, pushing new things happening and then feeding that back into the people that are socializers, the socializers eventually get bored and leave. And the killers, you know, and everyone else goes. So a game that's out of balance will eventually lose its interest. Um, and balance is, it is a difficult state to obtain uh, because you have to ensure that the game customizes it to the, to the individual's needs. So, um, so that's, I'm going to pause here and ask for any kind of response from, from either people that are online or people in the room about any thoughts they have because I want to talk about possibilities of a KOL-like game in higher ed just, just to bounce some thoughts off you. So I'm going to shut up there for a second. Anyone that's online, um, you either have the option, if, if you want to use audio, we're set here to hear audio, or you can type it in the chat. It's, uh, it's totally up to you, or anyone in the room for that matter. Does anyone have any questions on what I presented, or is there any thoughts that come to mind? But there, that was kind of the, the four player types, I mean, obviously they're pretty defined here, but I mean, I would gather, you know, being playing games myself, that they really, one person could make up all four types. I mean, is, are there any kinds of, uh, I mean, because it just seems so very, very structured. Um, but obviously you can have someone who is an achiever and someone who is like, you know, once, and people that actually, you know, you achieve things by, you know, by being a killer or, or whatever. Um, so I mean, I guess I guess it's it's common that even though there are the four player types, that really that could those four types could actually be like one person or yeah. And, and in fact, if if you go to gamerdna.com, there's a test you can take there to determine what your player type oh, really? is. Oh really? And you don't come out as as a hundred percent achiever. Right. You come out as you know I'm sixty <coughs> percent explorer, you know maybe ten percent killer. Mm -hmm. And I'm just thinking back to what I did. That's that's pretty much <coughs> good. I, I came out very low on the killing end, but I'm high on exploring. It's just something like your Myers Briggs. <laughs> it's very yeah. similar to a Myers Briggs <laughs> test. Mm -hmm. So, so yeah. You, I mean, the, these are these are boxes that we, we try to put around concepts so we can define them. But you know, in reality, you're not a pure achiever. You're not a pure socializer. You're a mix of things. Right. Yeah. I'm sorry. The second part of that is is the one thing that I've noticed um, lately with with games is getting to the achiever aspect of it is that they're they are putting achievement uh, scenarios into the games like you either like on the Xbox you got like your gamer score or the PlayStation you have trophies now I know that's a console is different than this but again that added um, factor where I, I never really would have considered myself kind of an achiever I would have been someone who would like to go in and fight maybe check out the world and that would be it you know once once I've done what I feel like I want to do I'm done but now that that like I've I've seen that like that achievement issue is a real draw 
and if you actually reward or like you said like you're saying about showing trophies or or medals or whatever that that is a huge huge draw and like there's even the the thing now um and i, I apologize i forget what it's on where people can be the mayor of certain areas Four square. Yeah. Four square. <laughs> yeah um you know like i had no desire to play that until i heard you know like was interested in that until i heard like you can actually you know usurp people and take over you know like someone else is the mayor but if you go visit that place so many times you can actually kind of knock them out of power like i mean killer yeah yeah so i mean but yeah. but i mean but the thing it's like i i would me that would draw me in and that would make me want to do it sure yeah so i mean it's just something new that i've you know really seen that there's a huge emphasis on mm -hmm. on it like so i guess the question out of all that is are is there a um kind of a hierarchy of those four gamer types like or they, they all just kind of coexist, or is there like okay, like achievers is number one, you know, killers is number four. I, I mean, don't think Richard Bartle intended it that way, as far as a hierarchy. I just think he was trying to define the players. Well, I've never read anything that defined it as you know number one, number two, I number see. three, or anything like that. They they coexist, and in so fact, none are more important than the others. Right, and indeed, he says you have to have all four types. You have to have affordances in the game for all four types. So, you know, you're, you're talking about like uh, like achievements and so on. Yeah. I'm not as much of a, an achiever, ex and, and I'm more of a goal-oriented achiever. So there's some people that will come in and I think play a game just because they want those 50 trophies. Right. I'll come in and I'll look at it and say, if I get that trophy, I'm also getting this really powerful sword that mm -hmm. will let me do something later on down the road. So I'll do the achievement for the, for the reward as opposed to doing it for its own sake. And I think. I think there's probably ways to divide people up like that. Really? See, I, yeah, see, I'd say I was the opposite. Like, I've done things in games just to get that achievement that I could care less about, right, right. you know, just because I've become, you know, what they call trophy whores now, you well, know, because well, that's, but I mean, yeah, but yeah, I mean, yeah. because that's that's what it's all about. Yeah. But it is, again, increased my interest in playing, has increased the replayability, um, you know, so that's why I was asking about the hierarchy because to me, because to me that is, you know, like I would say that that's my number one reason for playing. You should go to Gamer DNA and, uh, yeah, and, I think and, and try that out. And then they actually even give you uh, an embed code. You can oh, like, really? so embed it on. Like I have it on my blog site. You can embed what you're what you show up as. And it's it's, it's okay. kind of neat. So and there's a couple other couple other tests they have in there too that are game related too. So very cool. Um, but yeah, I I, I I see where you're coming from. Mm -hmm. I mean, I know some of the some of the older PlayStation games. They had, they were just some achievements were horrendously difficult to get. It your reward at the end was you got an extra five seconds of video <laughs> yeah. at the end of the game that somebody had already posted on, you know, YouTube or something. So why would you go to this extra twenty hours of work to get that achievement? But people do it for the achievement's sake. Well, and the other thing is, is that also you can now you know you compare what your friends are doing in the same game and like it becomes a competition. Absolutely. You know, and so again, that's. That's the other side of it, and that's why, like, uh, with Alan Rue and I, we're always like competing with each other to see who can get the most trophies. But see, that's a combination of not just achievement but socialization. Exactly. Yeah. So in that yeah. case, there's they, you're bridging that gap right. between the socializers and <coughs> the achievers. So it's it's interesting in the in the marketing world, um, Foursquare uh, is actually there. I'm hearing more and more uh, places like coffee shops and such using it, like extending the game. And saying like, if you're a mayor, as long as you're a mayor of this, you get a free coffee every day. So they're kind of extending the game and creating the you know, something for achievers who want to play it, want to look at it as a game. And I've never thought of it really as a game, Foursquare, until I read about that. That's interesting. Yeah. Well, it's interesting. That's I mean, that doesn't have much to do with this topic, but the way they're they're taking these social games and extending them into the real world. Right. That's pretty pretty interesting. Mm -hmm. I mean. Mm -hmm. yeah. So where does the game end? Right. Right. Do you know what kind of back ends involved with the game? It looks like it's mostly PHP, um, um, JavaScript, PHP. From what I could tell, I do know they have about eight servers. So they have some sort of load balancer that directs you to the right server and so on. Um, they generally have. It looks like they have about 1,200 people playing it concurrently at the most. So it's not huge numbers. Um, that, that's about as much as I could I could tell you about it. Yeah. So, to, but the technology behind it is not, you know, it's it's nothing yeah. cutting the edge for Just sure. Just a lot of information to keep track. It of. is a lot of information, uh, and like I said, there's there's thousands of objects that you can acquire, mm -hmm. and they each have their own properties, and 
there you have rare items you can find and ultra rare items only come up once in a blue moon and, and just ways you can combine items to make you know buy two or three items and making a new item mm -hmm. so there's all that kind of stuff going on in the background they didn't build this overnight I think they started in like 2003 or something like that mm -hmm. so and they keep adding to it um, and it's very interesting the revenue stream that they use for this you can play for free but if you want some of the higher end familiars that have a lot of powers or you want some of the higher end objects you go to their website you can make a donation like and you can do ten dollars twenty dollars whatever and then they give you a, a little <coughs> token that shows up in the world and that's a special token that can you can use to purchase those things and only that they can you can't purchase them elsewhere so mm -hmm. that's it you'll find that people will do that there's like the, the players that are really into it they probably sunk two three hundred bucks in this game over a period of four or five years mm -hmm. Other questions about the game itself, or Bartle's player types, or any of that thing? Um, can Can you think of a game where you played that you thought really balanced that <coughs> stuff out well, or didn't balance it at all? I mean, I'm thinking back to Spore, and definitely have the achievement stuff in there with all the trophies and so on. Um, killing, yeah, because other people could put up their creations and then you go to their world and kill their creatures. That they're <laughs> doing, so. So there was that. Socialization, yeah, because you could upload all your stuff. I mean, think about that. You could upload your stuff and share it on YouTube or wherever. Um, I'm trying to, what, what's, what's the other one? Uh, Explorers, which is you had the whole freaking galaxy to explore. So yeah, there's, there was no end to that. So I mean, that was a game that kind of accomplished those four player types. So um, and now whether whether that in and of itself made a good game or not, I mean, some people liked it, some didn't. So. Okay, if there's nothing else, if there's nothing on the uh, on the far end of the wire there, we'll keep going. Um, I've been thinking for a number of years about a, a KOL light game uh, for college students. And the reason I say that is it's fast paced, it does poke fun at the status quo, it's a casual game and you really only can play it for a few minutes a day. It reaches all the four player types if you were designing it like that. Uh, so I think it makes it perfect for college students. Uh, and what I was thinking about was you take a look at educators who strive for products in situations where the technology adapts to the user's needs at the moment. I mean, that's, that's really the goal of education technology. You want, we want personalized education and we want you know, just-in-time learning and all that kind of stuff because we know that works. Um, and you look at a game like KOL, it does achieve this at least on the affective level. Uh, it really helps, uh, so if it does that, um, affect is the most difficult thing to change instructionally. We know that as, as instructional designers. Cognitive changes are easy. Um, psychomotor skills, you can train for them and you can objectively observe them. But affective changes where people choose or they judge or they request, those things are hard, are hard to invoke change in an individual, they're hard to measure. Um, but if you can do that, Motivation, attention, and your desire to accomplish things, that all goes up. Which, you know, I always like to give the example, you can have really, really super crappy instruction, but if an individual is motivated to learn, they'll go through it and they'll learn from it. So, you know, that's, that's affect. So I was thinking, what if you had a game, and uh, there's some people in this room thinking, oh, geez, not again. Um, what if you had a, a KOL-like game that, that introduced students to the university? Uh, each college could provide information on the college and have adventures that could occur within the college. And so you could, you could start out, you could actually join a college, play through that college, and then ascend or start over again in a different college. It would be a really cool way to learn career goals and learn out what the college is about, have some fun. Um, you could actually tie achievement to real physical rewards like Penn State t-shirts or discount cards <coughs> or something like that. You could tie real life opportunities into the game. So there might be this, uh, you know, uh, there might be a really, really cool rock group that's coming, and that could be added in the game for a period of a month where you could do things and, and maybe, you know, distribute flyers for the rock group. <coughs> that comes to mind because you actually do that Kingdom of Low thing. There's one quest where you distribute rock band flyers. So that kind of stuff I think would be really cool. And, and, and the idea, well, I'm getting ahead of myself, 
the idea there would be this would not only be good for freshmen, it would be good for incoming students too. They could really learn about the university, have some fun, um, maybe find a friend or two through the game that they might not ever want otherwise meet. And then when they get there or shortly er thereafter, they've really got a better picture of the university and they've done it in a very fun way. And this is something if we built the engine right, we could have different people in different colleges adding into it constantly and helping build it. So I will, we're at 20 out, we, um, so I'm going to stop there and I'm just going to open it up to discussion about giving them loathing, player types, that idea that I had, or any other thoughts that might come to mind. And we have dead silence. <laughs> Well, I, I really like the idea of doing the, the university version of this game. Um, I think not only for uh, <coughs> incoming students, but it might um, make Penn State seem more attractive for prospective students as well. Uh, it'd be a good way for people to learn and find a way around campus also. Yeah, or at least find out what, what goes on in a particular college. Right. You know? And maybe even you know put in some silly things about the some of the professors that are there that are, you know, new or old doesn't matter, but so the people could kind of get a they get a be feel. Familiar. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, we could have the, the squirrel could be a familiar or this squirrel. Which for those of you that are on Penn State, we have a advertising campaign that they advertise one of the Penn State squirrels that are always running around. So but but yeah that I mean I think the idea is, is really kind of cool because even here at University Park we have these underground tunnels that nobody knows about, which would be kind of cool. So people would know about them, the dungeons. Um, we have all sorts of stuff that goes on, you know. So, um, it's, it's just a thought. And what I like about the idea is it wouldn't be something that a single unit would build. It would be something that the community, I mean, some unit would have to coordinate the efforts. But I would think DUS would be the leader in that. They could, they, I think they would be a main player, mm -hmm. absolutely. Yeah, because those are kids that come in and don't really know what they want to do. And so they need to explore different things. So, so it's perfect for them. The other thing I was thinking, and I didn't put this into the presentation, but a lot of times the game comes out and then the community builds <coughs> up the supporting structure around it. And, and lately it's been wikis. So KOL has this wiki that has every adventure in it that you can see and the description and everything. What if you reverse engineered that and you said, let's build the wiki first populate that out and then build a game based on what people have put into the wiki. That's another thought that I had. And that would be a way to involve the community throughout Penn State or wherever you do it, uh, in, involved in the actual design of the game up front. You could get the stuff in there and hash it out and argue about what should be in there and all that kind of stuff. And then when, the, when you say the wiki is complete at least enough to the point where you build it, then you build the game off the wiki instead of building the game and then adding the support structure around it. Crazy idea. What is it that draws you to Kingdom of Loathing, Brett? Because I know, and anyone who's played it can answer this question too. I mean, I, I've, I'm a huge gamer. I've tried to play this and, and a lot of the sort of Facebook games, Mafia Wars and Foursquare and all that kind of stuff. And I get, you know, a day into it and it just doesn't keep me. And I'm thinking if you're, especially if you're trying to appropriate something like this for education, like what, what is it that sort of keeps you coming back for more? I probably the first thing, and, and I know that you like to play the really involved game, so that I, and I, we've talked about this before, I right. don't have time to play the ADR games right. anymore. I am playing Fallout 3 right now, it's killing me, because <laughs> the time, <laughs> it's just killing me. These type of games, you, you go into them, you can play them for like 10 minutes a day, and you're done, but you play them over and over, you know, you keep going. And I think that's one of the main draws to me. Kingdom of Loathing in particular, when I, I it wasn't until I played through it and I had ascended one time when I was back in that second time that I realized how deep the game was. Mm -hmm. This game, it's like an iceberg. You know, you're only seeing the tip and you're going to play for a day or two. And it's it's like maybe you're only seeing, let me say, 10% of the iceberg. I think you're only seeing like 2% of Kingdom of Loathing if you play it for a couple of days. It's huge. And there's a huge community around it. I actually don't go in through the web anymore. I go in through um, a Java-based uh, program that's called KOL Mafia, because I have Mafia Penguins in KOL. And it, it actually 
helps me organize things. It's very similar to World of Warcraft where you can uh, put all these add-ons and customize your experience. So, but but the bottom line is that that particular tool helps me maximize my time even more because there might be a day where I just don't have time to play, but I can go in there. I can say I want to go to this area. I want to play 40 adventures and then stop. And so it does it automatically, and then I'm doing whatever I'm doing, and I've done my adventures for the day. So I think that's part of it. I, part of it also, and I didn't pick up this up till later on, is I've gotten to know some people really, really well through playing this game, through, through going down to this Hobbleopolis and playing through these clan dungeons, as they call them. Um, and I've met people, and we've talked about stuff, so I've gotten to the socializer part of me, which on my profile shows up as weaker, but yet through this game it's actually encouraged me to, to be more social and so on. So um, that's just been a really strong draw for me too. But again, I didn't get into that part of it until after I played the game for at least a couple of months. Because I, I, I didn't really need to do it, and, but I got to the point where I had to. So but that's probably some of the bigger draws for me. Um, time commitment and being able to socialize and do things that I normally wouldn't do in a game. So. I don't know. I mean, it's not it's, it's not a game genre for everyone. I mean, that's the other thing, we, you know, in educators, look at, they, we say, well, games are cool. Well, not everyone likes every type of game that's out there. I mean, there are different genres that you're drawn to, and, and how do you accommodate that? You can't. But you can accommodate player types in any particular type of game. I think that's the point that Bartle was trying to make. Uh, so you might not like Kingdom of Loathing, but if you're if you're an explorer, it might be you might not like the genre of Kingdom of Loathing, but if you're an explorer and there's nothing there for you to do, it might be enough to keep you involved. Now commercial commercial games, who cares about that? You're gonna buy what you like and what you don't like. But for educators, if we go into a class and say, here's a game, you're all gonna play it, and we know that probably 25% of them are going to love it and 50% are going to be okay with it and another 25% are going to say, I don't like games or I don't like this particular game. If we balance that enough, maybe we can pull that 25% along enough so that they actually have a pleasurable learning experience. I, and that's what I got out of the board. And we have a comment online. I have to admit I'm not a gamer. I'm more interested in theory behind gaming than actually playing itself, but it's serious games that teach critical thinking to catch my attention more. I yeah, I agree. I, you know, any of the games that are out there, even some of the simple ones, there's there's a lot of critical thinking that goes on in them, and that's sometimes difficult to quantify, but but it's there. So. Is maybe the terminology for something like Kingdom of Loathing being called a game kind of a misnomer? I mean, it is a game, but like you said, there's an educational component to it, and, and it seems like that just that term game might turn people off, but there is so much more to it. Yeah, I think, you know, one of the reasons they came up with this term serious games was to try to reach those people that were, you know, decision makers to convince them that games were okay. Mm -hmm. um, when I designed stuff years and years ago, we didn't call them games, we called them practice activities. And it was it was just semantics. That actually they sounds were worse than games. <laughs> <laughs> well, but but that particular audience that we we're trying to reach liked yeah. that terminology a lot better than games. So I mean, just something I, I don't know. I, I don't know G games. I think because I think you know the general thinking of what a game is is a silly time waster. You exactly. Know? And something yeah, like this really. It, it isn't. I mean, because like you said, there is those components to it, and 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 so like so that that just having that terminology is. Well, here, here's the rub. I, I totally agree with you, uh, and I totally agree that there are people out there that don't play games that think games are silly, and really, in order to understand what goes on in these games, you've got to play them. You can't just play them for ten minutes. You've got to play them for a long time until you start seeing what I'll call the affordances of the game for educational purposes. It takes a while to get that. Unfortunately, that the, the people that, that make decisions a lot of times don't play games. It's just not their lifestyle. Uh, they didn't grow up with them. They certainly don't have time now. And so in a lot of cases, it's a hard sell. It can be a really hard sell. Uh, the flip side of that is, is, fortunately, there's enough sound empirical evidence coming out 
of places like you know Madison and other places now where there's empirical research and there's articles being published in the you know the higher quality journals, the journals that are harder publishing, that people are starting to pay attention to it. So we have younger faculty coming in too that that I think because they play games, they, they see the value of them a lot more. You know, people my age and older than you know, they think of computer games a lot, still think of pawn and stuff. Yeah. Folks, we have about ten minutes, but uh, if there's a, if, is there anything else you want to talk about? Uh, any comments? You might be interested in a site by game design. This game is about social change. I don't know if I've heard that or not. Uh, Social change games are really interesting. I played one called Ice. I can something or other, but it was about immigration and put you in the role of a person that was in the country illegally. And you know, it's really trying. It's really trying to show that the immigration laws are, are not fair. I guess I would say. And very interesting. Games. So social social games for social change are seem to be on the rise too. There actually is a course taught here at Penn State that, you know, when I came back as a student, as an adult, that it was in development, and we did spend a, a large portion of the class discussing serious games, and, you know, anything from the rhetoric to what it's trying to teach and who it's trying to reach and the audience, and it's trying to break that mold of games are just silly, fun time wasters, and that you can actually send a message or you can teach through it. And uh, there's a book, I have to find it and send it to you, but uh, it's a very interesting book that talks all about serious games. Sure, sure. I would always like to or send me the, even just the title of it. So yeah, I, can get up I actually have it at home still. It was cool. worth keeping yeah. after the class was done. Yeah. Well, I think I think games, why, why shouldn't games be silly and fun? But that doesn't mean they're time wasters. It doesn't mean you can't learn from them. Why, why shouldn't education be fun? I'll just throw that out there. Okay, folks, if there's nothing else, thank you very much. Uh, we're, we are running these brown bags now. It's usually the third Thursday of every month. Uh, next month, we are doing one on March 18th. Is it March 18th? Social it's, network games. Is it, is it, are we doing the social media games that month? I think so. Okay. Well, anyway, stay tuned. Uh, go to gaming.psu.edu. That information will be up there. I'm drawing a blank on what it is. but. Uh, um, look forward to, hopefully, if you enjoyed this one, I look forward to seeing you next month, both the people in the room and the people online. You know, right. Right. Spread the word. Oh, no, next month is Games for Health Policy, uh, okay. Nutrition, and Fitness. Okay, so we're going to look at Sim Health, which is an older DOS-based game that we professor here at Penn State's using. It's a great effect, and a couple other ones. So, thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thanks. <coughs>